Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Again, coming back to this passage, the segue into eternal, understand that there are a lot of things that we see on this earth that are just temporary. They're not permanent. And we're looking at some gifts here and some different attributes that are really not eternal, which really is fascinating to me. When you think about there's an eternal nature of faith, there's an eternal nature of hope, but there is also a temporal nature of faith and a temporal nature of, of hope. The Bible says that which is seen is not hope. For if a man sees it, why does he yet hope for it? In other words, there comes a time when you don't even hope, of course, your joyful anticipation of Christ's return, when He comes back again, what are you hoping for once He's here? Once you're with Christ in eternity, what is your hope? Understand, faith is the substance of things uh, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you see the things, what is your faith in? What are your faith is based upon when you have first-hand knowledge, when you're with Christ, when you see Christ, do you have the same type of, of faith that you have now? In other words, he's in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, there's a segue into the eternal here. We're looking at the temporary nature of many things on this earth, and you're looking at faith, hope, and love. These things, but wait a second, the greatest of these is, is love. Why? Because love never changes, it never fails, it will never end. Your hope will end, but love will never end. You will have a time when what you hope for is actually present tense, and you don't have to hope for it any longer because it's reality. But love is something that will never end. And so in the, in the, in the nature of that, he's talking about the temporary nature of of prophecy, knowledge, and tongues. Those things will cease. They will end someday. And you say, well, wait a second, Pastor. Those are the gifts of the Spirit. Well, yeah, but there are certain gifts of the Spirit that are not permanent gifts. Let me explain that to you. You can imagine the gift of mercy. Some of you may have the gift of mercy. Mercy is really caring for people who are down and out. People are hurting. People are handicapped. People who have no way of paying you back. But you think about that. In, the, in eternity, do you really need the gift of mercy in eternity? Do you really need the gift of comfort in eternity? There are things in, in eternity that will cease to exist even though God initiate them and they are some of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We won't need them in eternity. You won't have the need for those gifts, the gift of mercy that you have today encouragement some of those things will be an automatic just because we are going to be with christ so some of the gifts are are not a permanent they're e they're just temporary i want you to think about this verse in the book of psalms i had my place held here and then i just moved it psalm chapter 8 please it says this when i consider the heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. And you stop and you consider that. I want you to just think about that for a moment. Love never fails. <laughs> We do not comprehend this idea of love. Just think, think with me for a minute. Right now at this point, they, they are estimating that the distance between the earth and the outer limit of our universe, the known limit of our universe is 46 billion light years. Which means that they are estimating at this point that the diameter of the universe of the known universe is 93 billion light years in diameter. Okay, try to comprehend 93 billion light years. 93 billion. And when they, they think about this, they have estimated that there are 1 billion trillion stars. 1 billion trillion stars. 
it's funny to me because you look at these things in, on the internet and there are many different, the numbers are all over the map. Someone has said there's 10 billion galaxies and other Wikipedia says there's a 100 billion galaxies. They have really no clue how many galaxies there are. But you consider the Milky Way and there's 100 billion of them? 100 billion of the Milky Ways that we are a part of here. 100 billion galaxies? Really? You know, at some point you start looking at the the, the Big Bang Theory, and it gets bigger, the universe seems to get bigger as science grows in their ability to see and be able to, to see. And, and this Big Bang is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. At some points, it's just ludicrous that you can have this universe of such incredible magnitude started by a Big Bang. And you have such a, a huge universe with 100 billion galaxies. And then you have this man here that God has created who is so prone to want to do it his own way and wants to be big and wants to make God small. If I can make God small, then it makes me big. And so we have this man in this earth that's six foot tall that thinks he knows enough to say that there is no God. He thinks he knows enough to say that I am the highest of all of creation or all of, of what he would say would all of uh, of uh, nature we are the greatest of all nature but anyway having said that this six foot tall man makes himself so big and God so small that I don't need God anymore that I make myself into God and you just think to yourself it took God six days to create all of this why doesn't he just wipe it all out and start over again in six days, I'm telling you, six days, by next Saturday, God could be walking in the garden again with a man who knew him, who he had just created, and God could be walking with him, this man. And maybe God, maybe the next time would work out a little better. Where mankind would actually start to love him a little earlier. Would actually believe in him a little more, you know? Why doesn't God just wipe it all out and start over again? You, you think about this incredible God that we have in, that, that have, and, and, and honestly, folks, you, you all understand that it seems to be, at least for you and I, a limit to how much we can love people. We love them, we love them, we love them, but at some point we just can't put up with it anymore. We just can't handle it anymore, and so we pull the plug. We're just not going to be their friend anymore because we just can't handle it. But there is no limit to God's love for mankind. God will not, he will not start over again. I was talking to my wife about this this morning as we we're riding in. You think, how many men divorce themselves from their wife, divorce themselves from their friends, divorce themselves from their mom and dad, divorce themselves from their church, divorce themselves because it gets a little hard. Things are not quite as easy as they should be, so let's pull the plug and let's start over again. Let's go somewhere else. And you think about a God in heaven. This is what he says. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should, not, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which are in the world, he loved them unto the end. And the same root, root, root word is used here to the word on the cross. It is finished. Again, we have our vows till death do we part. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'll be married 45 years this year. 45 years to Peggy. And I love that. I don't want to say till death do we part. I don't want that. I don't want to have to depart at death. Obviously, we'll be in heaven together. But every single relationship we have on this earth ends with death. And here we have this God in heaven who dies upon a cross. It doesn't end. He rises from the dead and what is the end? Having loved his own which in the world, he loved them to the end. What was the end? His death? Is that when he stopped loving us? No, it has nothing to do with that, does it? It means he loves them to the culmination of everything. God will never, ever stop loving mankind. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So God's love, Christ's love, never fails with us. Which means, folks, if you're following me, 
It means that I just do not comprehend what love is. I mean, understand that with mankind and how mankind has rebelled against God, has rejected God, has forsaken Him, and when we, looked, we just looked at that verse in John 13, what took place just after this? All of His disciples rejected Him, forsook Him, and fled. Peter denied Him three times. Judas betrayed Him right after this verse. I just do not comprehend that type of love. One of the things that we understand is that you cannot coerce love. Love cannot be forced. God will never force you to love Him. God cannot demand that you love Him. You say, but, but pastor, what about the first and greatest command? The first and greatest command is, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But what's very fascinating to me about this, and I've shared this with you before, is this, thou shalt, that sounds like a, a a commandment it's not it's really written poorly in English this is an, an indicative statement for you who understand English it means it's a statement it's not a command it is simply a future indicative statement saying you will love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and mind it's just a statement of fact now I think God understands that mankind is not capable of God's type of love. I am not capable of loving God the way God loves me. You are not capable of loving God. And you are not capable of loving people the way God loves people. Unless the Holy Spirit is in control of your life. Only God can love the way God loves. And God's Holy Spirit can empower you to love. And I think God made it very clear in this passage that this is not something that you and I are capable of doing. He's not saying you have to love the way God loves. He says you will love with all your heart, soul, and mind. You will someday. Someday you will have God's type of love. It will be a true statement. Someday you will love. And this is the first and greatest commandment. Again, as I said to you before, how does it work? How do you possibly love people the way God loves people when it's such an impossibility for mankind. When mankind divorces constantly and ends relationships constantly and mankind cannot keep his promises or his vows to anyone, how can mankind love the way God loves? Well, it's because of this. We read in it, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That is that word agape. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It never ends. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. It is possible, and you have at times had and understood God's type of love in your heart because of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible human speaking. You can't do it. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you're controlled by the Spirit of God, when you're controlled by the Spirit of God, you are able to love mankind the way God loves mankind. Now, please understand, it's not constant. Because you're not always filled with the Spirit. There will be, be times since God asks you to be controlled by the Spirit, but you will not always be filled by the Spirit. The Bible is very clear. If we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and His Word is not in us. We're not always filled with the Spirit. But when you are controlled by the Spirit of God, you will be able to love mankind. And you will be able to love your spouse. You will be able to love your children. You will be able to love the people in your church. Second point. And now we, <laughs> I'd say, this is, this is one of the hard things about being a, a teacher. Some of, the te some of the teaching doesn't have a lot of application. And when we start this part of it, it's not going to have a lot of application to you. I just need you to know this stuff. And so we're not going to be giving you a lot of application from this point on. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 says, Charity never fails, but whether it be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Evidently, prophecy, knowledge, and tongues are temporary. They're not going to last forever. Friends, look at this. Look at me again. It is without controversy. Every Bible student knows that tongues will cease someday. Every one of us knows that prophecy will end. Every one of us knows that knowledge will end someday. 
All Bible teachers know that. It's just a question of when. It's trying to determine when that time is going to happen, that prophecy will fail, whether tongues will cease and whether knowledge will vanish away. When is that going to take place? The Bible says, when that which is perfect is come. Well, let me just share with you, first of all, when that which is perfect, it cannot be talking about Jesus Christ. The author would never say that. That which is neuter. If you understand how English works, there's masculine, there's feminine, there's neuter. Same thing in the Greek. Neuter just simply means it is a neuter ending. It's talking about something, not some person. If he was talking about some person, he would have used masculine. It, was, it would be translated, when he who is perfect has come. When he who is perfect, and that's not how it's written, it's not how it's translated. It's when that which is perfect has come. It's something that's perfect is going to come. And when that perfect thing has come, then the partial thing is going to be done away. Now, frankly, folks, I think there's only two possible possibilities in that that which is perfect. There's only two things that it can possibly be. It's either the kingdom of God, when that which is perfect, when the kingdom has come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When the kingdom has come, then the partial is done away. Or the word of God has come. When God's word is completed, then the partial knowledge is going to be done away. That's the only two possibilities to me. Biblion is, is a neuter word in the Bible, the word Bible. One thing I want you to understand is this. I believe it is the Bible. I believe that when the Bible's come, then the partial's done away. And I want you to explain, I want to explain to you why. Frankly, I'm not talking about any person that comes to this church. This is just where we are in our passage. And I just want to explain what it's saying. But I want you to know this. If you disagree with me, that's okay. You do not have to agree with me on everything that I talk about when it comes to tongues. There are differences of opinions here. It's okay for you to disagree with me on it. If you want to accept the fact that it's a kingdom. But let me explain to you why I do, do believe that it is the Word of God. First of all, I want you to understand in the context, prophecy will end, knowledge will end, tongues will end. I believe it's very clear in the Bible that prophecy has already ended. I believe prophecy is done. Let me explain why. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. When you build a foundation, that's not at the end of the building, that's at the beginning of the building, and the foundation gets concluded at some point, and it's not added to. You build a building, you start the building by building the foundation. That's one of the things I did on my, on my vacation. I went and helped my son-in-law put his foundation in for his, his new house that he's building. That's something I've done a lot of. It's underground. You don't see it in Minnesota because the foundation is at least, in this, this area, 42 inches. Up north, it's 60 inches underground. The foundation has to be 60 inches underground to get below frost line. And so we put the, the fo footings down under 60 inches, and you have to fill everything up so you don't ever see that foundation. The foundation is completely covered. You might see a basement floor, but that's not the foundation. Underneath that basement floor, there's going to be a footing that's going to be holding this whole building up. But that footing is built first. It's the first thing that's put up, not the last thing. And what happened in the church, the church was built upon a foundation of, of apostles. There were 12 of them. We don't have apostles today. We had apostles then. We don't have them today. If you look at the book of Revelation, the new city has 12 foundations, which are the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. They're the name of the 12 apostles. There's not 144,000. There's 12 apostles. And the Bible spells them out. It tells you what the foundations are, and it says that they're the name of the 12 apostles. It says you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, please understand, again, for I testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, the book of Revelation, if any man add to those prophecies, God will add to him the plague that are written. God is saying there's a curse upon anyone that hears those words and adds to those things. I believe it's very clear that there are no more prophets, no more prophecies being fulfilled. And that's the problem with Joseph Smith. That's what's the problem with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon has the problem in the fact that if you're adding to the prophecies of this book, and they call Joseph Smith a prophet. 
And so since he was a prophet, he gave us another revelation. I'm saying, if any man add to the prophecy of this book, God will add the plagues. It's a problem. It's a par- problem because God did not add to the prophecies of the book of Revelation. What's funny is that we have 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. And there are a lot of people out there that still believe that God is giving us revelation today. That He is revealing Himself constantly and there's more books being added. I really got a kick out of one, one guy on the radio a while back. And, and I hope you think this is funny. I thought it was funny. And I, I'm not, not, not going to say names because I'm not trying to to you know be insulting here but this this one man on the radio a man in his church and i'm not asking you to do this a man in his church came up and said i'm giving you money for a brand new car you can buy any car you want i'm buying you a new car so this this t- this radio evangelist went down to the chevy garage i think i told you the story once before but he went to the chevy garage but god's spirit was not in the chevy garage So he went over to the Ford garage, and God did not speak to him in the Ford garage. But he went to the Cadillac garage, and yes, (laughs) I'm serious. I I was hearing this. I just laugh at this because in the Cadillac garage, God spoke to him. (laughs) And God was in the Cadillac garage, and so he bought himself a new Cadillac. And I thought this was really comical to me. But there there are a lot of people out there that do believe that God is giving you additional revelation. And one of the things that you're hearing today a lot is all truth is God's truth. Therefore, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is also God's truth, which is God's revelation, which means that that is also equal to the Bible, which means you have the Bible and you have science. And anything scientific is also revelation from God. And you're missing something there. There is God actually speaking to mankind and revealing who He is to mankind. And He has created the laws of this universe and He has allowed man to know those laws, but it's not the same as His revelation. The revelation is very clear. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be complete, completely, thoroughly equipped to every good work. And this is written during Paul's time. And Paul is saying, listen, the Scriptures that God's given are sufficient to meet every need you have. It will thoroughly furnish you to every good work if you have all Scripture. And if all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and again, this is during Paul's time, and the Scripture of Paul's day was sufficient for that. Now, once again, the fact that that prophecy has ended, I believe anyway, that prophecy, and it has given us a clue of what's taking place in 1 Corinthians 13. That we don't have additional revelation. I know someone was saying to me that that they, they, they heard a man talking about a uh, church they were going to that they believe that tongues are still for today. And, the, and the, the man asked him, do you mean to say that you believe there's additional revelation for today? That God is continually revealing himself? And the man said, well, I don't think that. He said, well, that's what most of tongues is about. Most of tongues is an additional revelation of God to man. Let me explain to that to you to that in a minute. But anyway, the sub, by the way, there's other types of people who think tongues differently, so I'm not going to say all tongues is like that, but the subject here that we're looking at, there's a couple things that are important. The subject is about knowledge. It's not about kingdom. We know in part, and we prophesy in part, when that which is perfect has come. The, the subject here that he's talking about is, again, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 13, he says this, when I was a child, I I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. He said, for now we see through glass darkly, but then face face. Now I know in part, then I will be known. And the subject is knowledge. The subject is being, being able to be known and to know like I am known. And so the subject is about knowledge. The subject that he's talking about, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is not the kingdom. It's not even alluded to anywhere there. So it has something to do with, with understanding or knowledge. The kingdom will not be a time when knowledge will cease. I, I want to ask you that. I want you to consider that. The kingdom is very important, of course, to us. But when the kingdom comes and you are with God, I have the feeling that is when knowledge is going to increase more than ever about God. When you will have a learning curve of who God is when you live with Him, 
when God is on the earth and God is, is speaking to us and He is actually total revelation of Himself, that's going to be an incredible time of knowledge. And so I don't know if you can say knowledge actually ceases in the kingdom age because that's when, when, going to be the highest learning curve of knowledge that we've ever had. Chapters 12 and 14, the point of this chapter is about the abuses of the gifts. And if you read chapters 12, 13, and 14, the whole point of chapters 12, 13, and 14 is that these gifts are not to be used individually. If you're going to use them, use them with an interpreter so the church may receive edifying. The gifts are not given individually to edify individuals. He says here, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors for the perfecting of the saints, plural, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The whole point of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. It's not individually. It's not so that I will receive edification from God. It's so that I will in, be able to edify others through the gift that gives to me. That's why it's so important in the book of 1 Corinthians 14 that there's an interpreter so that the church may receive edifying. He says it over and over again. The gift of tongues was being abused and Paul wanted to put these, the gifts in po proper perspective that they're only temporary. This is a segue into the eternal. I want you to understand that there's something far more important than tongues. It's love and caring about people and loving people. Having that desire for people, it's far more important than tongues. Tongues is not designed to be self-centered. Tongues is designed to love people and to care for people, and that's how it's used. Again, revelation given through knowledge. There are three major ways that revelation is given in the New Testament. Obviously, the New Testament was not given yet. People did not know all of the scriptures of Ephesians chapter 3 about the church, didn't know 1 Corinthians 15 about the rapture, didn't know 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. All of these things were all mysteries, something not known, and God chooses to reveal these things to them through knowledge. God gave a special knowledge to people that they would know. God gave to John a special ability to prophesy. <coughs> and John... <coughs> could foretell what the future was going to be. And God gave him that gift to prophesy and to be able to explain a revelation of the future events. Tongues was one of those ways that it was used. And one of the ways, again, a person would stand up, unless you had it, and someone else would stand up and say, this is what they said. Whether they had the knowledge of that language or whether they were received a gift of interpretation of that language, they said, this is what God just said to us. He said, for by grace are you saved through faith, write it down. And not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And they wrote these things down in these revelations that were given to them, that were given through the speaking of tongues and through an interpretation of tongues so that God's Word was being given out to the church in miraculous ways so that people could understand it. I must have hit, hit the wrong button here. Let me try this again here. First of all, let me explain to you the mysteries here. I have a little bit of time here yet. The mysteries of the church... The word mystery, musterion in the Greek, the word mystery means not a truth concealed. It means a truth revealed. Now, it's really important that you understand. When you see the word mystery in the Bible, it does not mean like hallmarks, movies, and mysteries, something that you don't know what the answer is. What a mystery is in the Bible is a truth revealed for the first time. And Paul will say it, Behold, I show you a mystery. Why is he showing you a mystery? Because it's a truth that's being revealed for the first time. A mysterion in the Bible is a truth revealed, not a truth concealed. So it's a little different than what you see today. And he says, Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. To make known was the fellowship and the mystery from the beginning of the world that hath been hid. It's been hid from, by God, but now is being revealed. And so Ephesians chapter 3 is all about the mystery of the church, how that is a truth that's being revealed to the apostle for the first time, and he's sharing it with them in that book of Ephesians chapter 3 and writing it down. So understand that that's some type of knowledge that's being revealed to the apostle, 
And the apostle is writing it down and sharing it in an epistle with the church, this mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as is, it is now revealed. Again, it's a truth revealed for the first time unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. In other words, you are going to be part of the church. That's the mystery that was revealed for the first time. The mystery of godliness, even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generation, now was made manifest, a truth revealed. The mystery of godliness, and the truth of, of this mystery is that Christ is in you. That's the hope of glory. That's what godliness is all about, that Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would be able to give you the ability to have godliness in your life through His, His, uh, His presence. The mystery of iniquity, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. I'm not going to explain that passage right now. That's not my point. The point is that was a mystery of iniquity. There is an Antichrist. He's already living, that, but the hindering force is hindering him until he be revealed. There's that mystery of iniquity that is already at work. And he's talking about the Antichrist that will be revealed in the future. Behold, I show you a mystery. We'll not all sleep. We'll all be changed. This is a mystery that's revealed for the first time. Listen. It's not revealed to the first time to Darby. You'll hear that. People will say that Darby was the one who invented dispensationalism. He's the one that was the first one to talk about the rapture. There's many churches in town that don't believe in a rapture. Autumn Ridge does not believe in a rapture. I'm just saying that Darby was not the one who invented it. This was given to us by the Apostle Paul years ago. It was given to us in the New Testament it's a mystery, a truth revealed for the first time that we're not all going to die. We're going to be changed. That's what the rapture is all about. We're not all going to sleep. We're all going to be changed. The mysteries. Cretes and Arabians do hear them speak. The wonderful works of God. Now listen, I want you to understand again, as I shared with you before, tongues was not jibber-jabber. It was not a heavenly language. It was a revelation of God to man. They do, did hear them speak in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. And I'm not sure that the, the disciples, when they were speaking in tongues, had any knowledge of what they were saying. But the people who heard them did. And it wasn't in a jibber-jabber. It was in our language we heard them speak. We heard them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Well, it wasn't just anything. It was God's revelation. His wonderful works were being revealed through tongues. And I said, that's one of the ways that tongues was used in the New Testament. The reason why tongues was no longer needed was because the revelation was completed and God wasn't adding to this revelation. He was not going to give us a book of Bartholomew. There was not another book that was going to be given. He gave us all of his revelation in this book and he gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the revelation of God. And so he didn't want us to add to it. This was his completed revelation and that again is what we believe. If we didn't believe that, then we'd be searching for God's revelation in every single person, in every single gift. But God has not chosen to reveal himself to us a number of times. He chose to give it to us 66 completed revelation in the book, in the Bible. And so in the, in the New Testament, when tongues was used, it was given so that they would understand in their tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, please understand, if it was just to unbelievers, you wouldn't need the interpretation because the unbelievers would already have a language that they could interpret it. But if it was in the church, given revelation in the church, then you had to have an <coughs> excuse me. You had to have an interpreter in order to make this revelation clear to the church. And that's why the gift of interpretation was so important. I'm done. <laughs> okay. As I said, this was not a message about application. I wanted to explain to you this passage of what I'm saying, seeing what the Bible teaches in this passage. There's a lot of different interpretation. I hope you look at 1 Corinthians 13 and see, is this what it's saying? Because it's not up to what Pastor Lapine says. I am not the one who interprets the Bible. The Holy Spirit interprets it, and he interprets it with his word. And so you compare other passages to see if, this is, if what it's, I'm saying is, is correct. And you have that responsibility to be able to look at this word and determine whether it's of God or not. And so yet let me be one to be able to explain what I see, but allow the Holy Spirit to direct you if this is what's true or not. Once again, we th want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. 
If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.